is up out there, everybody, and thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives. That's right, it's me, Cam Hale. And as always in studio, I can't seem to get rid of him. He's like an ingrown toenail. He goes away and then he comes back again. But this way, he's fixing to be gone for a week. Mr. Calvillio Vilson. How's it going, everybody? I'm glad to be here in Skeleton Studios. I've been working like a dog, trying to cram two weeks worth of work into one week. And I'm at the end of the week. I've got it all done. The last thing I have to do is the podcast. So I'm a little bit wore out. But yeah, I'm looking forward to a vacation. Me and my wife, we have never been on a vacation, just the two of us, since we have started having children. Yes. So that's yeah. been 10 years. You know, time flies. Uh, the kids, they all look a little bummed out that we're not taking them with us. But yeah. I'm like, look, man, we need a little bit of break uh, from the grind. I, I know I need a break from baseball and all that. And uh, so we decided, um, let's go somewhere we've never been. And I promised, because I worked for a company, I know if you follow the show, then you're aware of this, but if you're not, I worked for a company doing my uh, real estate work for 17 years, and I've been talking about quitting and starting my own company for a while, and I promised my wife if I ever did that, that I would take her on a vacation. So Mm -hmm. I did that in July, and so we kind of picked that up. Where's something we want to do? Where's some place we want to go? I'm sorry. And uh, we like, we're outdoorsy people. The forest of indoor. Right. So we want to hike, and I was like, you know what? Sounds really fun. Why don't we go up to the Redwood Forest in Northern California and just do some hiking and stuff? So that's what we did. We just, you know, we just said, hey, that's as good a place as any. Let's not overthink it. Let's just go there first. Next year, we'll plan a trip somewhere mm-hmm. else we've never been. I, in fact, she's already talking about next year. Uh-oh. We want to go to the other opposite side of the, of the country. We want to go up to Maine, maybe, and check that out. But yeah, so we're going to be flying into San Francisco. And then I know on the first day, we are going to drive down to San Jose and go to the Winchester house. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll be able to video or take some pictures of some ghosts there. There you go. That's another destination that would be pretty cool to check out. And then we're going to go north, and then we're just going to kind of hang out and uh, do some pretty cool hiking. I'm sure I'll be posting photos on Instagram and Facebook. And I heard next year she wanted to go with a new husband, though. She was tired of taking you places. I I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately for her, though, her husband is the one that makes the money. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You're like, I got to take care of her. Yeah, we're doing this uh, literally late, late this Saturday night. And uh, we got to get done because Kyle leaves in a few hours to get on a plane. When I say a few hours, I mean like uh, less than a handful. He's going to have to pack and he's going to have to try to catch an hour of sleep and then leave to get over there at uh, 5 a.m. to be at the airport. Yeah. To ch- <laughs> Look, if y'all can see his face, it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, when it comes to packing and stuff, this is a funny thing that happens with me and my wife every time we go anywhere is like she starts packing like two weeks out. <laughs> And I don't pack to the last minute. And it kind of gives her anxiety. She starts freaking out. She's like, are you going to pack yet? I'm like, no, I'm not. You do it on purpose now, don't you? No, I just don't see the point. Now you're a liar. You do it on purpose. You could pack early, but you're like, no. I could, but then I might need some of the stuff that I pack, so then I have to unpack it. So why why do twice the amount of work? I wait to the very last minute. I get a bag or a suitcase in this case. I throw a couple pairs of underwear in there, a couple t-shirts, a couple socks, a toothbrush, a couple shirts, a couple pairs of pants, some shorts, some shoes. You're good. Give me half a dozen of those naked lady tees. Give me one of those. Give me six of those. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And uh, another thing, if I do forget something, I'm always like, you know where we're going. They have stores, right? So if I run out of something, I'm sure I can stop and get something. (laughs) I'm not that stressed out about it. Yeah. So. It's a vacay. After we're done recording this, I'm going to pack my bags. Yeah. So what's been going on with you? Dude, I played some disc golf this morning. Had a couple of rounds of disc golf. Uh, That's about it. Just been working. We were uh, switching one of our systems over. And then there was also a slight leak at the, uh, our water plant. Uh Uh-oh. Like it's no big deal. It's just a little leak. And uh, it's one of those on the, the raw water side. So we found it. I mean, it was one of those, it wasn't like it was hiding, but that's just been causing some stress in the system as far as uh, all the guys I deal with. And all. so my whole last week was just as crazy as yours. Like I said, I went back and forth to the lab. I can't even tell you how many times. So yeah, it's been pretty maddening. This whole week was crazy, but the greatest thing about it was we got to have a good friend of the shows come on and sit down to talk to y'all for this week. Mr. Mike Mays, the Texas cryptid hunter. Now we've had him on our very fourth the fourth show we ever did, Mike came on, and then we've had him on before talking about his book, Patty, when he wrote the children's book. That's right, yeah. But we had him come on because Mike's been not just, of course, involved in uh, uh, Wood Ape you know, research, but he is one of the guys that has never let go of like black cats. He is the guy that's, you know, that's one of those things, I guess. And we get, we talk about it in the interview and you'll hear us discussing it is, is around here. It's not something that is, uh, I, I guess you could, for the 
the lack of a better term, call, uh, call it a cryptid animal, is I know ton, I've never seen one, but I know tons of people that have or that claim that they've had experiences or seen black panthers or black, you know, mountain lions, things like yeah, that. Yeah, but so yet here, the Texas Parks and Wildlife doesn't recognize they them. They're saying, rec- no, yeah. that's impossible. Yeah. When, when clearly it's not. I mean, there's photographs taken from game cameras, mm-hmm. trail cameras, yeah. things like that, and numerous sightings all over the state as well as like Oklahoma yeah. and Louisiana. And, uh, you know, they have sightings uh, even in, like, Arizona Mm -hmm. of other jaguars. So I'm like, I'm always like, well, why is it impossible for a black cat to get up here from Central America? Because we know that cats have large territories. Yeah. Like, one mountain lion may have, like, a 100-square-mile territory. I think the thing that makes it hard, at least in my mind, is there's no species of all black. It has to be something that is uh, genetic, like, you know, melanistic, almost like a fallow, but you're going to get the, the black. And I think that's the deal is it's it, it's so rare, but yet there's so many accounts, it almost feels like it's another species. But but anyway, look, folks, we get into it. Mike is a wonderful dude. Uh, I urge all y'all to go check it out, to go in, check out his blog, check out the NAWAC, dig into any and everything of that stuff. We get to talk to him about a lot of that. So we get into some crazy black cat talk. So when we get back from the break, we're not even going to beat around the bush, folks. Uh, we'll be chatting with Mike. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's roll this puppy up, let's baby. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Guys, what is going on? We have got a great one for you today. To say this fella is a friend would be an understatement. We had him on the show for our very fourth, not first, very fourth show that we've ever done. We had him on a couple years ago talking about a book he had written. And he is a great friend of the show and a fella that puts in a lot of hard work. This is the Texas cryptid hunter, Mr. Mike Mays. Mike, how are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great, guys. Appreciate you having me on. Man, it is good to chat with you. I always keep up with you on Facebook. I always watch about all the football stuff and all the the stuff going through being a coach and all that stuff. And then you're, how do you find time to do what you, people ask us, but I'm asking you, how do you find time to balance all this? Uh, Well, uh, (laughs) I'm not sure I really do. Uh, The blog uh, has actually suffered quite a bit over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, I have not been as inactive as the the blog might indicate. Uh, I've been trying to keep everybody up on Facebook and and Twitter and those things, just little snippets here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but uh, with the teaching and the coaching and the uh, you know, especially during football season, it's it, it's it's pretty tough. I'm not gonna lie to you. So. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure how good a job I'm really doing, to be honest. <laughs> well, it's enough to know that uh, everybody needs to know that at least that you are about to publish another book. And it's not just over what we would all consider it being over. Most everybody thinks when they hear the Texas Cryptid Hunter or the Narwhack, the North American Wood Ape Conservancy, any of that, we, you start thinking of Wood Ape, Big, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and things. But I remember mm-hmm. you had touched base on some stuff a while back when we had spoke, and we've had you on discussing a little bit of it, but you have really gone in depth over the Black Panther sightings that are reported here in our in our state. And it's something that's extremely interesting because – we all know it's a real creature. We all know that there are mountain lions and there's panthers and and then that there's also these black versions of them. But it seems that they're a lot more than maybe we we realize. And a lot of people don't even want to acknowledge that, that they're out there. They'd laugh it off like that's not what people saw. So let's dig into that. Let's see. What have you been working on? Well, we'll start with just, just the animal itself. Um, you sound a lot like... 
me and all of my relatives who grew up in East Texas who, uh, you know, a black long-tailed cat was nothing, to, to say it's common would, would not have been accurate, but uh, it was just another animal in the woods, you know, mm-hmm. it was like a bobcat or a coyote or anything else. Um, however, science disagrees with us on that, and there is technically no such animal recognized uh as as a black panther there's no such creature uh, as far as north american big cats though uh mountain lion uh, uh the jaguar in rare instances uh that's that's all that's really recognized as far as what would might fall under the big cat umbrella um the black panthers you see in movies and on tv are either melanistic leopards which are either african or asian cats or melanistic jaguars which are uh you know which are starting to to creep back into north america but are really more mexican central america south american cats Um, there is no documented species that's considered a black panther so um You know, when when someone talks about that to a wildlife agency, uh, be it Texas Parks and Wildlife or whatever the state might be across the south, uh, they get treated as if, uh, you know, they're reporting the unicorn sighting or something because there's not supposed to be any such animal. I guess it is. (laughs) It would be really hard to wrap your head around if you've been taught i guess that it's not but you're you're right is my dad would talk about it and we had family members and friends of the family that would talk about seeing them like you know they'd, i've never seen a mountain lion but they would talk about seeing mountain lions and they'd talk about seeing the black cats They're like yeah we saw like a black parent there whatnot and i know for a fact it's been oh i think i want to say it was almost a year ago it's in november i believe of 2016 didn't they see one i want to say in arizona was a, an actual but it was a jaguar not a black one but they had trail cam footage of a jaguar in arizona so we know for a fact they're up in the united states so it's yeah. one of those deals so for them to be a, a colored like you said a species of it but this man looking at some of these photographs they don't necessarily resemble a black jaguar they look more like a black mountain lion to me. Yeah, and and that's one thing we get into. Uh, I get into in the book. Um, you know, we we get. I give a little bit of um, you know historical perspective. We talk about some his uh, some stories uh, from the past, um, old newspaper reports, and and you know semantics are important uh, because you know, the, the way the animals described in print is, is very telling. Um, and I think you guys could probably attest to this, you know, here in the South, uh, and into the Southwest, when somebody says cougar, you, you know, which you're talking about, if we're talking about the animal, we're, we're, we're talking about the blonde honey colored big, you know, cat, the cougar, Mm -hmm. uh, the mountain lion, the puma, how uh, there are various names for it, um, but when the word panther is is used, ninety nine percent of the time that person's talking about a black cat, mm-hmm. and um, the the one area where that is the exception might be in Florida, where the the um, the Florida panther is a pretty highly publicized endangered species there. And uh, the public in that area, especially South Florida, has been educated quite a bit on the, the plight of the Florida Panther. It's, it's been struggling to survive. And even the hockey team that moved down there took on the name Panther, and they've got a golden-colored cat. But any other mascot anywhere that you see, uh, they're using Panther. It's black. You know, the Carolina Panthers, the Pitt Panthers, you know, these are these are great examples. And... Uh, uh, most people, when they use that term, you know, they're talking about, you know, the, the black animal. Uh, some of these old newspaper clippings, they use uh, terms like Mexican tiger or Mexican lion. That was, uh, those were terms that were used to describe jaguars um, back in the day. Uh, they used the term wildcat. That, that's, that equates to a bobcat. 
And then they use the term panther, and sometimes they'll use them in the same sentence. There's one old report that talks about a, a calf that was killed, and they suspected it was either a Mexican tiger, a wildcat, or a panther. So you're talking about three different names used in the same sentence, uh, and they're differentiating between three different species mm -hmm. there in, in the way that's written. So that that's interesting. Um then we go into some modern, you know, some stuff recently over the last, uh, oh, you know, 40, 50 years, including some very recent ones. I, I just get reports on a weekly basis, and uh, uh, a lot of those are going to be in this book. Um, people are seeing something, and, and then we get into, okay, well, what are the, what are the possibilities here? Um, what, are our, what are our suspects? And we get into that. Well, is there, it seems to be too, that it's, does it, is there certain areas, I guess, that would be more of a hot spot of what, because you would think of them in, when you, when I always think of mountain lions, I always think about them kind of out in the West or the Big Bend area, and even up in this part of North Texas where it kind of rolls and all that. But I know that there's been several sightings in and around the Metroplex. Like it's because, I don't know if it's easy food, easy table fare for them or what it is, but you would, you, I guess when I think of that, I don't think of a panther, mountain lion or anything. I, I picture bobcats. I mean, I've seen bobcats in downtown Fort Worth. So, I mean, I've, I can imagine that, but I can't imagine a cat like that slipping around in a, in a, like a subdivision somewhere, but you've received like some accounts from where they've been on the edges of these subdivisions. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that's actually, you know, uh, uh, Collin County, Denton County, uh, you know, that whole Plano area, uh, Lake Ray Roberts, um, lots of there. And, and, and you're right. It, it certainly is not what you would, um, it's not what you would first picture, uh, as far as prime habitat. But the interesting thing about the, the Metroplex, while, while it has sprawled out quite a bit, uh, it's almost it's almost like the old frontier. When you hit the edge of it, man, then there's nothing for miles. Um, and there's uh, there are lots of creeks, riparian areas, uh, green belts that run through the city. Um, the Trinity River runs right through the heart of everything. Uh, and um, anything that was moved mainly at night, nocturnal, could likely get through there without being seen if it didn't want to. Um, as far as, you know, why so many sightings, I don't think that there are necessarily more of them there, but I, I, for a sighting to occur, there has to be, there are two factors that must be present. One is the animal and the other is someone to see it. And so you get out into East Texas where it's lightly populated, there are going to be fewer sightings because there are fewer people. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, one little pet theory I've had for a long time and you, you know, you mentioned the bobcats that, are, that have become very urban, um, uh, one of the things I discovered while researching for this book was, uh, that I found very interesting was over in India. Uh, they did a study, they collared some leopards that were considered problem animals because they were living basically in town, in, you know, right, right in a pretty major metropolitan area. They took them, they, they, uh, they hauled them off and relocated them. And there were five of them that they did that to, and every one of them came back. And uh, uh, they were not only they, – they were not transients. They weren't passing through. They were living in what would equate to the city limits over here of this, this town, this big metropolitan town in India. They were rarely seen. They, were, they did not – they weren't man eaters that had interest in people. They were picking off pets and livestock from time to time. But, you know, they were uh, procreating. You know, there was at least one litter of cubs that was born. Um, they were doing just fine in a very urban environment. So it, it's possible that some of these bigger species, like a mountain lion, or uh, might have finally caught on. And, and they're starting to adapt the way coyotes did, the way bobcats have. Um, and maybe and they're starting to do a little better in closer proximity to people. And the other part of that is, you know, there are a lot of run down all but abandoned areas in some of these larger, uh, some of these larger cities where, you know, warehouse districts and, and, uh, overgrown, just kind of, like I said, just kind of abandoned areas 
where the bobcats and the coyotes and feral dogs and things are roaming around and, and they're just full of rodents and they're, and, and rabbits and possums and, and all kinds of stuff that quite frankly, you know, a, a big cat, um, while he may not stay there forever, uh, he could do, I think just fine for, you know, period of couple weeks. And again, moving at night in this sparsely populated area of town, may not be seen at all. Um, so, you know, this urban cat theory is something that I've, I've become very interested in. And, you know, the like you said, bo- the bobcats almost become a common visitor mm-hmm. in, in, you know, Fort Worth, Dallas, Houston. Uh, the, for Pete's sakes, they had a coyote on top of a, a roof in New York City a couple years ago. <laughs> Nobody's quite sure how he managed to do that. <laughs> so, you know, if they can do it um, – you would think uh, the big cat could do it as well, at least on a limited basis. Well, it's one of those, like I said, it's one of those things. It's it's just in my head is because you always think about them being more stealthful. And, and I'm mm-hmm. sure that I've been in, in the woods with them, close to them. And just because I've seen the tracks, I've heard them call, all that stuff. I've just never witnessed one. But I knew they were there. You know, you just, you can always hear them. You know that they're out there and things like that. But... It just something about it strikes you as like they're never going to want to come around the city, but that's not true. I think it's something I have to get over because I mean we laugh all the time driving through town here where we live. Is you have to be on the lookout for white-tailed deer running through town, uh, right down the road from my house. Almost run over some. When I say down the road, I'm like a block around the corner. They was turkey. You had to honk and get the turkey out of the road. So if those are there, then big cats are going to be there too because well they eat them. That's just kind of how this whole thing works out then like we talked about with coyotes grabbing you know house cats and and, you know uh sure sure and you know the thing is they're they're going to have to in some cases adapt or they're just not going to survive so uh, i'm not sure the situation is tenable long term if they are uh living in more urban environments at least on occasion Uh, i'm not sure that's going to be tolerated by people Mm -hmm. um but I can see where there might be a process starting where, you know, these species are, are, are having to adapt at least somewhat in some areas to the presence of more people. And, uh, you know, hopefully there, there's going to be a way where people and the cats can survive in fairly close proximity without, you know, any, anything bad happening. But, uh, um, you know, it's it's interesting, and uh, again, that that's one of the things in the book we talk about is is we go in depth on that uh, leopard study over in India, and um, you know, if one species of of you know fairly comparable in size can do it, uh, there's really no reason to think it could not happen here. I, I you know, and and you know, you go out west, you know, you know, we had a we had a mountain lion uh, roamed right into downtown El Paso. They end up having to shoot it at a car wash. Happens in California all the time. Oh yeah. Um, uh, and there are numerous. You know, uh, a cougar was shot in in Chicago for Pete's sakes uh, a while back. Um, and they roam over long areas. They have really big ranges and. Um, like I said, some of these some of these bigger cities are built on major waterways, rivers, and, and such, and uh, with big green belts that you know abut them, and and these things kind of just, as we all know, creeks and rivers are kind of wildlife corridors for movement, and I can see some maybe just passing through, but they kind of get caught. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's as unlikely a scenario as a lot of people might assume. Uh, like I said, I'm not saying that it's something that's happening all over all the time, but, but at the same time, I don't think it's something that's never happening, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this then, since you've talked to, you know, some of the wildlife biologists and things and done the research where they claim that there are no black cats, there's no, unless there's some melanistic version of them, there's no black cats. What could they possibly be unless they are? Of course, this is going to be the crazy conspiracy mind of mine. Do they do they know that there are species and maybe that they are 
in the decline or something where they don't really have enough evidence of them or that they do have evidence of them and they just don't want to add them for some crazy reason? I'm, I'm, I don't think that that is true with um, the whole Black Panther kind of phenomenon. I'll use that as kind of a, kind of a catch-all phrase. I, I think there are several possibilities as to what people are seeing. I the, the, the fact of the matter is there has never been a documented – case of a melanistic mountain lion ever anywhere and you know i understand what um what science what the mainstream scientists are saying that look, look as many as we have in captivity and breeding and we we'd have had one somewhere by now if they carried the genetics for melanism it would have exhibited itself at some point by mm-hmm. now um so i understand their doubt um there are However, some pretty interesting historical uh, accounts. There's uh, there's a pretty well circulated photo uh, of a cat, of clearly a cougar, mountain lion that was killed in Costa Rica, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, it was 1959, and it's an it's a black and white photo. So, but it is an extremely dark cat extremely dark uh you can't tell is it just a really deep kind of chocolate brown or is it truly black because of the nature of the photograph but it's very intriguing um there are reports going further back uh, some naturalist in particular there was a a gentleman last name of buffon and i'm probably pronouncing that wrong uh, he was french um came over here and was cataloging animals in the new world and uh he uh, he cataloged a, uh, an animal called the cougar nor, nor and again my my accent's probably just brutal, uh, but uh, it was supposed glossy black on the dorsal surfaces and much lighter, uh, cream colored to light gray underneath. You know the inside of the legs, the belly, the muzzle. Um, it sounds very much like a cougar only black and that was something you know he was among the most respected wildlife guys in the world at that time and uh he documented that in his writings um but there is no carcass there is no no pelt there's no photographs uh that are absolute 100 percent uh documentation of of a melanistic cougar and there's a problem with it anyway because cougars are two-toned they're you know honey colored blonde uh and and they range in how dark they get uh but they're they're two-toned their underside their their ventral surfaces are are white or cream colored they're they're two-toned and the reports we get almost without exception are of solid black animals they're they're not lighter on the underside they're not lighter around the muzzle they're sometimes people claim they can see faint spots on them if the light hits them just right but they're not saying that they're getting that uh uh that two-tone look like you would expect in a true mountain lion and the the texas parks and wildlife their official position is that they these black cats do not exist in texas is that correct Correct. that's correct but yet you know, like you mentioned, you get dozens a month of sightings, and you know, I've looked at your website for years now, and there's game camera footage, there's pe- snapshots people have gathered. I wonder why so many people are seeing these black cats, but yet the Texas Parks and Wildlife says that, no, it, it can't be. They don't exist. Do you think well, that uh, they're just- you know, the, the Parks and Wildlife, um, well, in 2005, I, I saw a cougar in the Sam Houston National Forest. Um, it just it crossed a Forest Service road. It was me and a friend of mine uh, was late at night, and it, uh, it just made a road crossing, just kind of slunk across the road. Um, long tail, typical colored mountain lion. I mean, there's no doubt what it was. It was probably no more than 15 yards in front of the vehicle. And um, there was absolutely no doubt about what it was and uh saw a ranger the next day and reported it to him and oh oh you must be mistaken uh you you must have seen a bobcat 
And, uh, you know, naturally a little bit offended. I'm like, no, I know what a bobcat looks like. And this thing had a tail that was almost as long as its whole body. He says, well, we don't, we don't have cougars in these woods. So that there, there's a real reluctance to even, uh, um, admit or acknowledge that there are mountain regular colored mountain lions in East Texas, much less anything as unusual as a black uh, species of cat of some kind. Now that was 2005. Maybe if I talked to somebody down there today, it's been a while, maybe they're a little more open to it. But um, um, back at that time, all they uh, just as far as a breeding population, a mountain lion uh, was basically West Texas or deep, deep South Texas along the Mexican border was, uh, you know, the Trans-Pecos area and, and down along the border were the only areas where it was accepted that there was an active breeding population of lions. And um, that's just, in my opinion, that's never been true. Uh, I know they were hunted to the brink of extirpation you know in in the east but i don't think they've ever been completely gone and, and they're still there now i am just i'm i don't it's one of those things it feels weird because it, it i was always right i guess it's one of those things like if you was raised up if your family had had a a sighting of bigfoot or an alien sighting or anything like that my father had seen several mountain lions but he had talked about the black panthers like it was just an everyday thing it was just well back home it is back yeah. home it is i mean th these people they don't know there's not supposed to be any such thing you know i mean let's face it mo most folks are too busy going about their daily business trying to make a living and, and pay the bills than worry about what some guy in a white lab coat is telling them is real or isn't <laughs> so when you when you tell them Hey, you know, there's not supposed to be any such thing. What, what, what do you mean? You know, you get the I know what I saw, and ain't nobody going to tell me yeah. what I saw. And and they're ready to fight. They they're ready to fight you right there because you're you're impugning their honor and integrity and their sanity. And you know, I was I was the same way. I was well into my thirties before I realized that. There's no such thing, according to mainstream science. Well, if you even go to on the, the Texas Parks and Wildlife website, it will tell you that contrary, this is what it reads, contrary to popular belief, there are no Black Panthers in Texas. Right. And, and you're That's like, correct. it's crazy because I'm like, look, I've never seen one, but there we have photographs. We have listeners are, that have contacted us to get in touch with you before. We've gotten stories about them. All this where people have had this like, no, that's exactly what I saw was well, it's, I, I think, this is what I've know, seen. You know, I hate to slam them too much uh, in one sense, because, look, science demands a body. Mm -hmm, that, that's exactly. all there is to it. You know, it, it, a picture will never be good enough. Uh, uh, and we've had that discussion talking about other species uh -huh. before, but no piece of pho photography, no, no film, no uh, video, no, no photograph is ever going to be enough to justify the documentation of a, of a new species or a, even if it's not a new species, a novel, possibly subspecies or, uh, something along those lines, uh, you're going to have to put one on a slab. And, and that's unfortunate in one way. Uh, but that's what science demands. They dem demand a tight specimen, a holotype. And until that happens, uh, you know, it's not going to be accepted. Um, photographs will always be doubted. Um, eyewitness accounts, you know, they're good enough to send somebody to death row, but they're not good enough to get someone to think that there might be a big cat of some kind roaming around, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, an ironic situation, but, um, that's just the way it is. And, and, and like I said, there really, there has been no documented case of melanism in, in cougars. Uh, jaguars are, are extremely rare, uh, um, or are thought to be extremely rare anyway. Um, but, um, and so, you know, 
they're assuming misidentification and uh, th- like I said, th- there are some possible suspects that um, people might be seeing from time to time that uh, um, are making them jump to this panther conclusion. We talk about that in the book. You know, we talk about mountain lions as, as a potential uh, suspect. We talk about jaguars. Uh, um, there's a real interesting case we made about. Uh, the possibility of a relic population of jaguars uh, maybe getting cut off from Mexican jaguars and, and uh, the the allele, the gene for melanism in jaguars is dominant. So if you are breeding with, um, if they're breeding with other melanistic cats, you know, you're, eventually you're going to stop seeing the, the spotted coats in that isolated population they could become all but exclusively um black you know so th- that's an interesting argument that that you could or interesting theory i guess i should say um there's a smaller kind of odd looking cat called a jaguar rundi mm-hmm. that most people do not know exists um in most cases they're not much bigger than domestics but they are kind of otter shaped they're they're odd looking they're long bodied very long tails uh, kind of a flat head that, that they can easily give you the impression they're they're longer than they are, and um, and some of them do get bigger th- than the domestics. But one of the things that really interested me is what's going on in Australia. Uh, they're having a big controversy over there about big black cats as well. Um, Australia's got all kinds of wildlife. Most of it wants nothing more than to kill and eat you um, over there, but um, they've never had a native species of big cat over there. there there's not an indigenous species of cat in Australia, mm-hmm. and yet they're having all these sightings, and uh, the dominant theory over there is that they are the descendants of ferals, and that these ferals, for some reason, are growing to abnormally large sizes over there they're growing just regular domestic cats basically that have been feral for several generations and they're 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 growing to be the size of small leopards you know 50 pounds and uh somebody sees a 40 or 50 pound cat they're they're not thinking domestic cat they're thinking you know a big cat of some kind and uh the most famous example a guy named kurt engel shot uh what he thought was a panther uh was tested and the dna came back as felis catus which is just domestic cat it was just a feral cat but it was enormous you know it was six feet long from the nose to tail and why that's happening over there uh, lots of theories to that but there's some really strong anecdotal evidence that that's exactly what's going on over there and i think if that is at least a possibility for some of the the visuals over here Um, because we have a real feral cat problem in this country. Um, Every little municipality across the country has got a dog catcher. Uh, We're set up to deal with stray dogs, Mm -hmm. but we're doing nothing, nothing about stray cats, Uh, nothing. And they're roaming and they're responsible for, quite a lot of damage to, to wildlife and especially birds. And, um, there's nothing really to keep them in check. Uh, so, uh, I think if it could be happening in Australia, it's a distinct possibility that it could be happening over here as well. And, you know, it, it, you get into to all kinds of possibilities. You know, we talk about, you know, uh, so Jaguarundi, the big ferals, uh, possible hybridization when her- ferals get to a certain size uh, uh, with, you know, say the uh, big feral uh, couples with a bobcat. Well, now you've got the genetics for a long tail and melanism in this new, this, this, this hybrid uh, cat that's out there, um, and it's going to be bigger and then a normal cat and, and that's going to take people off guard. And then, you know, you get the old classic standby, 
escaped ex- exotics and pets that had been turned loose and, and things like that. So we cover all cover all that stuff in the book, and um, uh, it really is is interesting. Um, and I, I'm not sure there's any one answer. Uh, I think it's very likely a combination of all of the above. It's still something that's it's it's crazy to think of that there's like that running around and that people are seeing it. It it, it still makes you start thinking about Bigfoot. It always does when you bring it up. Are there any sightings that you can share with us, right quick, and one that in particular that you really enjoyed, or something that about that sighting that kind of caught you to really kind of sunk in? You talking about the cats? Yeah, the cat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the, um, I guess, one of the more intense um, sightings that that really hooked me and got me interested. There's a lady that lives in Ellis County, Texas, out not too far from Waxahachie. And um, matter of fact, she lives right on Waxahachie Creek, and um, she has horses, and um, she was out. It was cold. Now, this is going back several years now. This may be six, seven years ago now. Um, and she went out to, I think she was pulling some alfalfa out for the horses late at night. It was real cold, so she was trying to take care of them. And she had this stuff in a metal horse trailer, so she opened it up and was making quite a bit of noise. And uh, I don't think they'd been on the property very long. There was kind of an overgrown area and uh, not too far from where they had this trailer. And she started to hear something the way she described it is charging her. Uh, and it was tearing through the brush and, and growling and carrying on and it broke through the brush. Uh, and there was a, a trough, a metal horse trough between her and the animal. And what she described as just a great big black jet black cat came barreling out of the brush and pulled up about 10 feet from her and between and, trough was between her and it um and you know she started to back up she uh, yelling at get out of here get out of here she's backing up putting her hands up waving them around and stuff she was not armed at the time and this thing just you know uh you know growled and and pawed at her you know you've you've seen them kind of swipe you know their paws and stuff and then uh, she got back far enough where she made a run back to the house and this thing you know disappeared uh now, I've, you know, bluff charges are something I've seen in other animals. I'm not sure how common that might be in in cats, if at all. I don't know if I've ever heard of that. Um, but um, she was backed up uh, a few days later. Her fiancé that was living there as well uh, was out and saw big black cat, big black cat walk in the fence line um, not too far from the area where she had her encounter. And you know this guy's a uh, a veteran. She, these are she's a school teacher. These are level-headed, normal, really non-kooky people, you know. And and to have both of them claim visuals within days of each other is is pretty intriguing. And this is a spot where I've had game cameras up off and on for the better part of four or five years now. And I've found some got some real interesting shots. Um, including cats you know some they've been all bobcats so far but um and one maybe of something dark with a with a long tail but it's so fleeting it's just it's hard to say you know i never even published it because it's you know you just you just can't tell for sure but um that was a pretty intense one um there's another sighting uh actually it was years and years ago uh, um, but the guy recounted it to me uh, just recently of uh, he was hunting uh, out, out in Hill County and uh, was hunting um, a creek bed and he had kind of set up, uh, had a twenty two rifle, not looking for anything big and something comes through the brush and walks down to the bottom of the dry creek bed and it's, it's he called it a black cougar. It's exactly how those are his words and uh, he kind of he had his rifle, you know, the stock was seated on his shoulder there, ready to take a shot. And as it came out, he'd never seen anything like that before. He kind of lowered his rifle, maybe sat up a little, and that caught that movement, caught the cat's eyes. And it, um, 
he said it started to kind of get his back legs underneath it, kind of tensing like it was about to, to jump at him. And so he took a couple shots. He's positive. He hit it at least once, screamed and howled like a, you know, like a, a woman being murdered is the term he used. And it ran off and he ran off and he went home and got a, a bigger gun and came back. And of course he never, he never found anything. So, um, so there are some, uh, kind of intense encounters out there. Uh, most are very fleeting, you know, road crossings, a glimpse of, uh, of a cat, you know, I've got several where people drove up at night and there was just a cat laying on the hood of their, or the, or the top of their other vehicle, just sitting there swishing its tail, looking at them and it just hops off and saunters away. You know, wow. it's, uh, so you've got all kind of quite a mix of different kinds of visuals. Wow. Well, what is the name of, uh, do you have a name picked out for this book yet? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we're going to call it shadow cats. Um, the Black Panthers of North America, I believe, is the is, is going to be our title, and uh, we're looking at January on the optimistic end, and February of 2018. Uh, worst case, as far as it coming out, it's being published through Anomalist Books. Um, you guys are probably familiar with mm-hmm. Lyle Blackburn and his stuff, uh, same publisher, and um, that does Lyle stuff and and many more folks and uh we're you know excited about it and we've got a whole chapter dedicated to pictures um uh that people have taken and and sent in to me and uh um you know there's some interesting interesting one one uh it's very interesting was a study in canada they got a game camera photograph of a black panther i mean there it is biggest day it's right there it was described in the study as a black jaguar it was taken in Ontario, though, now you tell me that's not a strange place to find a, a tropical cat like <laughs> For a real, yeah. And, uh, it, it, it's described in in the study in amazingly nonchalant terms. It just says, "Oh, here's a picture of a black, a melanistic jaguar outside of Ontario," and that's all. It's nothing else is even mentioned. The study was about mountain lions, and by golly, that's all they were going to talk about. And uh, um, it was just kind of put down as someone's escape pet, and uh, and that was it. But, I mean, so there's all kinds of really cool photographs in it um, that cover the gambit of, of the possible suspects. Um, so it's it, it was a lot of fun to do. It was a lot of work, and be, we had talked earlier before we came on about my schedule, and <laughs> uh, it took far longer to do than it probably should have, And uh, but finally got through it, and... Uh, Pretty excited about it and and pleased with how it came out, actually. Well, I can't wait to check it all out. This is something that's always kind of fascinating to get off on on this little side round and, and check all this stuff out. Mike, if they want somebody, one of the listeners, wants to send you an encounter that they had or something goes along with these, where can they find all this and where are they going to be able to get all your books and all that? Okay, well, uh, well, first things first, contact. You can contact me. It's uh, TexasCryptidHunter at Yahoo.com. And if you can't remember that, you can just look for the Texas Cryptid Hunter blog. There's a link there. There's in the margin over there. It gives my email address. You can you can contact me that way. I would say if, if you're wanting to go into details and you're wanting a reply, um, then I need you to um, send an email. A lot of folks are they'll read a, a post, uh, a story, you know, mm-hmm. uh, on the blog, and then they'll hit the comment section. And they'll leave a comment with their experience or whatever. But uh, almost without exception, uh, comments left or filed under anonymous. And uh, I can't I can't reply to a comment d- directly. So if you're wanting a response from me, I need you to send an email uh, at the t- Texas Cryptid Hunter at yahoo.com. Um, as far as where the books will be available, um, uh, the anomalous books page um and i will certainly have a link on the blog uh that uh, and you know that you can click that should take you directly there but it's going to be available anywhere you know books are going to be sold the amazons the barnes and nobles and 
books a million and all those spots should be carrying it once it comes out that'll be perfect well we can't wait to read it we're glad that you that you've put it all down and built the book out of it it'll be something to go back and check out mike thank you so very much for coming on and spending the evening here with us and we'll let you get back to it so you can at least catch up on some of this downtime that hopefully you've got <laughs> yeah downtime yeah that's right now and it's time to go do the honey now, that's right so, uh, but i appreciate you guys having me on it's always a pleasure it was great matt thanks so much all right guys thank you back with expanded perspectives uh i love mike mays i love talking to him the texas cryptid hunter he does a lot of fantastic work his blog is amazing if you go in there it's just hundreds of sightings it's, it's awesome and he has it for everything yeah and and he admits that he hasn't he hasn't kept it up to speed like he wanted to because of with work uh, and stuff with work yeah. and that's right he is a he's a teacher and he is one of the men that guide the young men under the friday night lights here in texas he's a high school football coach so yeah, we're there's Mike has a lot of irons in the fire. <laughs> yeah, and he was recently on a television show, the the Low Files. If yep. you watch uh, Rob Lowe and his series with his two boys if, when they go up to Oklahoma and the Wachita yeah, Mountains. Yep. And if y'all are elite members, you're going to get to hear that. Mike hung around, and we got to talk about the Low Files. We got to talk about a lot of other big footy stuff with with Mike. Uh, and so we're like, hey, let's just stick it on the elite. So for the elite this week, you're going to get to hear that on Friday. So you'll get to hear some wild uh, Bigfoot stories and stuff with Mike and, and Rob and all of his his That's kids. right. Yeah, and I'll put links to his website and blog and things in the show notes. And also, I have to uh, bring this up since we're talking about it, uh, the links and stuff. Um for those of you who have done the new iPhone update, oh it's got Lord. a completely new look, and so I am messing around myself trying to figure out how to navigate through the podcast section, uh, that where the show notes are and things like that. It's all different for those of you that are purchasing the new iPhone 8 or 10, or I've just done the update on an older phone. Uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. So if you have any problems, uh, bear bear with me because I'm the host of the show and I'm having problems trying to navigate it. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure if you get in there, there's probably people that are way smarter than me that can figure it out. Uh, but if you have no. any tips, uh, please send them to the show. You can email stories of your own or news or anything like that to the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show 817-945-3828. You can follow us on all forms of social media. And if you want to get elite, don't forget, you can sign up for that. It's $5 a month. You'll get an additional show every Friday, as well as access to the entire back catalog. You just have to go to the website, expandedperspectives.com, and click on the Elite tab. Signing up is easy. Cam, we got some exciting fights tonight before we get out of here. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going on right now, so we're going to have to get some stuff knocked out. <sighs> I'm going to ask you real quick, what's your prediction on the main event, Michael Bisbing versus George St. Pierre? Bisping. Bisbing all day. I think so, right? It's yeah. not that George is not a great fighter, but everybody knows who's a big fan of the of the sport, so that when you take off for four years, man, the sport can really pass you by. Anything will pass you by if you quit doing it for four Now, he didn't quit training, of course. He no. did all that. But when you're not in the thick of things, and it seems to be fighting is one of those things. Anything that is man-on-man combat like that, as far as like wrestling and jujitsu and all that stuff, I mean, it's like you can take a little time off in baseball and then come back and play baseball, but something about that, the lights and the, I don't know, it just, we've seen too many people that, you know, it almost also seems like fight cardio is different than training cardio. So I want to see how this works. Well, um, and I'm wondering about that because George is fighting at a heavier weight. Mm -hmm. He's older by four years. He hasn't fought in four years. And uh, Bisbing, man, that guy's got amazing cardio. He doesn't get tired. 
He doesn't get tired. And he can and, take abuse and not get tired. And he's one of the best, as even because George does have a good double leg and stuff like that. But Michael is amazing at getting up. He can back his way up a cage like nobody. Reminds you of Chuck, don't it? He's very, he's very good at that. And you know, and um, if George, you know, George has a good jab, or at least he did. Um, but um, I don't know. I think it's gonna be interesting. But I do think I give the edge to Michael because Michael. For whatever reason, he seems to be fighting better and better as time goes on. Yeah, I mean, he's wild. a much better fighter now than he was eight years ago. Yeah, it's wild. I love watching that. Speaking of that, uh, this this Friday, this coming Friday, I will be at uh, Gillies in Dallas to watch uh, the Honey Sloth uh, try to go for his move that we've named. So I'm, I've bet the tattoo on him. But uh, so if he gets uh, the submission, the twister in the in the match. Uh, I have to get a tattoo of a sloth, and I was talking to him today, matter of fact, and he wanted to give uh, me a heads up, uh, so a big shout out to Dakota Ronello and Miss Shelby uh, for new parents-to-be. Oh, really? They will have a baby this summer, this this coming June. They will probably end up with a baby. Well, congratulations. So, congrats. It's amazing. And, and something else. We were nominated, and I shared it on Facebook. There's a link on Facebook, if y'all are following us, that you can go to, that uh, is a Google Docs link that you can go and nominate us for some kind of award. Okay. You know, and put it all in. I wish I knew more about it, but Kyle and I, we, we put it up there. We're like, okay, if y'all want to do it, it'd be awesome. We don't really know much more about it other than that. It's something we don't keep up with, but it would be awesome to win some kind of award. And last but certainly not least, thank y'all all so much for taking the time out to write reviews all the new folks that have found it uh i would love to give you a shout out and i would love to go back and listen but to be a hundred percent honest with y'all i think i'm about 150 names back (laughs) and y'all piled it on so much uh i've read look you're written when i told you you don't have to say anything nice just give me five stars it's all i'm asking and but if you want to say i got a tank of gas and y'all did it there are reviews that said <laughs> i bought a tank of gas five stars uh, let's go look we're, we're bumping up there about 600 almost now like we're just a couple a few shy handful shy 600 please folks whether you have it or not what it does for us is it's the only way that Apple will recognize it in iTunes. So as reviews come in, it doesn't matter for downloads. It doesn't matter for that. We can have hundreds of thousands of downloads. It does not matter because without the reviews, the show will not be noticed in the top page there, whenever you, the new and noteworthy, however it is when you click it on. So the reviews are the best way to help us out tremendously so even if you don't have an itunes account and you don't want to download it but you know somebody else that does well just go use theirs yeah, say right. let me borrow your itunes account i want to leave a review whatever you want to do this time if you want to say i got a new pair of shoes just be like daddy's got a new pair of shoes or mama or whoever just they got a new pair of shoes or tell us that you hate christmas music because they're starting to play christmas music about this point and i'm not a fan i'm not a fan of christmas music until it's christmas time i don't need it in november yeah but it's almost here you know it's yeah and i could i could almost be six foot tall but i'm not (laughs) not even not even close but folks for all of you that written reviews i will try to do my best to go back and start calling out some i really will but thank y'all all all so much it means a whole lot to us and thanks again to mike for coming on and spending his time with us it means so much to us to just have friends like that out there y'all are all so great i don't even know man i just it's it's one of those things. I really feel lucky to get the chat with all you. I do too, but I got to be going. So I got to wrap this show up for you. Elite members we will be talking to you again on Friday, where we'll have a continuation of our interview with Mike Mays. For everybody else, we'll talk to you next Monday. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Kyle, stay out of trouble on your flat. Peace.